Hi, my name's Shlomo. I'm a beatboxer, which means I make music with my mouth. And uh, I'm very excited to be here in Dublin at the Science Gallery. <laughs> Okay, that's it. Put some more sounds on top. Next up, we need a bass line. It's really fascinating to come to uh, an event all about um, voice and the science of the voice and different types of voice because I've always found this very fascinating. Um, my background is um, as a drummer. I, I started learning drums when I was eight years old because my parents were fed up of me banging on the pots and pans. Um, and so I was always obsessed with rhythm and music but, but I'd always be practicing uh, my drums all the time. If I, if I didn't have my drum kit I'd be tapping out rhythms on my, on my body and I'd be clicking rhythms with my teeth and my tongue and I didn't know it was called beatboxing or something that anyone else would do. Um, it was just my thing and when, when I heard other people beatboxing I was just blown away. I was like wow this is fantastic I need to learn how to do this too. <laughs> It's always really energetic up on the stage and I always come off feeling really drained and like it's, it took me years to realise that um, I get, I'd always be really hungry when I came off stage but I never knew that and I'd come off and I'd just be like a, a burbling wreck, I couldn't really speak, I couldn't really cope and, and for years I just didn't know why and then one day I just had like a sandwich and I was like I'm here again so like yeah it uses up a whole lot of energy. What we've been doing here, by the way, has been really interesting. We've done two of these events as part of the, as part of the show. And what we found on each occasion is that we've sort of ended up, I guess, that the, science has, the, scientists, the science has sort of, uh, uh, in a way, el elucidated yet more of what we don't know about music. You know, we're kind of on the cusp, I think, of a, a really fertile period in what the science can tell us about the vocabulary of music and the technology of music and the science of music, but not the poetry part. And that part still remains, still appears to remain kind of immutable and mysterious and enigmatic. And that's been a lot of fun. I guess if we were to start talking about what Roisin uh, just did, I mean, it, it's such a um, u universal part of our musical experience and it's, it's so 
matter of fact to us. We're all singing in some shape or form, but if we were to really start talking about what happened there, it would take us into all sorts of areas. We'd have to start talking about uh, the technology of how she produces her voice, her chest cavity, her larynx, her, her throat cavity, her sinuses, her mouth cavity, all of these things, her posture, all of these things would feed into the production of her voice. We'd probably have to start talking about the, the neurological aspects of it. If we could wheel a big MRI scanner in here and stick Roshin in it while she was singing, wouldn't that be fun, actually? Um, but we would, I'm sure, you know, we'd see her brain kind of lighting up because we'd see all of these hot spots of, of neural activity while she's singing. Just had your second child recently. Yes. Well, she's 14. 14 months. months. Yeah. And, so and she's walking and bruising herself. And does that work on her, by the way, that tune? Or this tune actually does work on her. She's very receptive. Yeah. Um, I, I had a CD launch a few years ago, in 07, and my first child was only a few months old, and it didn't work on her at all. She didn't. She didn't like it at all at all. So different strokes. Tell us about uh, the music you heard as a child, because your mother is a singer too, right? That's right, yeah. There'd be a lot of car journeys, long car journeys, and these were in the days before um, car seats and being belted up and stuff, and I just remembered uh, standing behind my mother as she was driving the car, my two arms around her neck, and we'd be singing all these different songs and lullabies, like... Yeah, but uh, it was brilliant, and then... The, I have a lot of cousins, and we used to have, um, when we'd be brought together, which would be quite often, really, um, there'd be party pieces before going to bed, and everybody would have to come up and sing their little song, whatever it was. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to ask Jennifer to come down and uh, Jennifer's going to perform a piece uh, called Nature Data. I originally composed the piece, it was a commission for a performance in the Imperial, um, Royal Imperial Palace in Vienna in the Butterfly House and they have this amazing tropical environment where you know it's about 27 degrees Celsius, it's very humid so it's perfect for a singer in fact, you feel lovely. Um, but they have butterflies flying around and moths and birds and all sorts of things and so when I wrote the piece I thought I'd only use animal and insect sounds because um, that felt appropriate to the, to, the, to, the, to the site and so I spent a lot of time researching animal and insect sounds. Insects are all around us. They produce many sounds at many frequencies and volume levels. We are so accustomed to hearing insect sounds that we seldom listen to them. Let's try an experiment by listening to this recording of a typical suburban backyard. I'm going to ask um, Professor Conrad Tymon from the Iron Air to talk to us a little bit about the machinery in a sense of what we just heard, which is kind of, we heard some really extended techniques there that probably stretch the machinery of the voice to its absolute limits. So. The voice box is a very complicated little, little piece of machinery. It's only about one and a half centimeters in length, the vocal cords. 
and they're actually quite, I, I think they're actually quite good looking things to look at. They're, they're pure white and they have two layers. They move, they move in and out. And in fact, your main function of your voice box is not voice production at all. It's actually protection. So it, if you're eating your food, it stops the food going into your, into your lungs. And the secondary importance of it is to us is, to, of course, for communication. Um, when you're breathing, your cords open up to allow air into your lungs. And when you're speaking, your cords come together. And at the very edge of those cords, you get a fluttering. And that's what causes the sound that we know as voice. And you would think that this fluttering might be occurring at maybe five times a second or 10 or 100 times a minute. It actually occurs at 250 times a second. So it's a very, very fine movement. And I think that interferes with that movement will cause a voice disturbance. So I think you'll probably hopefully be able to see the video now. All right, so if you just keep your head on the position you're in now, it'd be lovely. And we'll have a little look. So we're passing the camera along the floor of your nose. You generally feel a pinch at that point. You're feeling that? Yeah. Ow. Well done. Well done. Perfect. So just swallow for me. Great. OK. I can see your larynx, so just get a decent view of it. Right. OK. So I have a nice view of your vocal cords. OK. So whenever you want it, let fly, please do. Okay. I think the, the effect that I saw the most was I could see all the muscles in my throat working. You could see all of that going on, you know, and, and so it was a very interesting experience, which is why I volunteered it's for it. Physiology, <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's beautiful vocal cords, as you can see. I, I, I certainly can appreciate them anyway. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to ask any questions on that. What causes hoarseness? Uh, well, hoarseness is not... A, a, hoarseness is, is a change in voice, and... Um, there are two main causes of, of, of change in voice, but 80% of them are due to what, we talk, what we're talking about, tension. And that's where, as I said, if you've got that, the, the two layers of the vocal cord, if one has to be moving over the other, and if, that's, if you tense the muscles, that movement, everybody can speak hoarse. If you tense here, and that's generally the most common thing that we see. Hello, I'm over here. Hi. Um, <laughs> I mean, speech is, is unique to humans, but obviously making noises with uh, one's voice is not unique to humans. W what are the differences, if any, between the vocal cords of humans and non-humans? You'd be glad here there's very little. Uh, we often um, operate and on, for instance, uh, other, like for instance, pigs and, and dogs to kind of reproduce the type of operations we, we do. So there's very little. Functional wise. So, so the, the, the difference that is responsible for speech is more cognitive than, than yeah, physiological? Uh, exactly. <laughs> Flanagan, um, I'm conductor of the Mornington Singers, um, which is a Dublin-based uh, chamber choir ensemble of about 30 singers. Um, and we've just come from our performance and science gallery here. We've done a, a programme of 30 minutes 
contemporary music. We, we have generally we have a real commitment to, to contemporary music anyway. So um, when I when I spoke to Jer, Jerry Godley about um, about doing this this concert, he was quite keen on, on that angle of things that we do. You know, um, I suppose the experimental nature of this exhibition, the music in the body led me to think that it would be quite effective in this context so it's you know we're in a, a science gallery it's experimenting with new ideas about music and, and the body so um, I suppose we want to do something different a little bit different from your run of the mill choral program. found out that um, in my experiments I found out that um, when you when you beatbox a lot of the really low bass tones they actually um, escape they come out the side of your throat and um, unless you have a second microphone it all gets wasted all the bass gets wasted it's terribly ungreen <laughs> luckily Science Gallery have brought in some huge subwoofers for me which is those two boxes on the floor, which is where all the bass comes from. going to finish off by showing you some stuff that I also do with electronics which enables me to loop my voice which means I can um, create really structured music with like um, different I can do because I can do many instrument sounds and although I can do things at the same time this enables me to loop a certain sound and leave that going while I take care of a different sound so it's quite fun
Thank you.